My father was, he is on the left here, my father was officer of the general staff of the Soviet army. He was inspector of land forces, Soviet troops stationed in countries like Mongolia, Cuba, East European countries. This is the picture taken at the entrance of my Institute of Oriental Languages. It's a part of Moscow State University. As every Soviet student, I was, quote unquote, volunteering for harvesting grain in Kazakhstan. By the end of my training in school, I was recruited by the KGB. This picture was taken on that day, and you can see again how happy it feels to be recruited by the KGB. Pay special attention to number of bottles on the table. One of my functions was to keep foreign guests permanently intoxicated the moment they land at Moscow airport. In 1967, the KGB attached me to this magazine, Look Magazine. A group of 12 people arrived to USSR from the United States to cover the 50th anniversary of October Socialist Revolution in my country. From the first page to the last page, it was a package of lies. Our conversation is with Mr. Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov. Mr. Bezmianov was born in 1939 in a suburb of Moscow. He was the son of a high-ranking Soviet Army officer. He was educated in the elite schools inside the Soviet Union and became an expert in Indian culture and Indian languages. He had an outstanding career with Novosti, which was the, and still is, I should say, the press arm or the press agency of the Soviet Union. It turns out that this is also a front for the KGB. One of his interesting assignments was to brainwash foreign diplomats when they visited Moscow. And he'll tell us a little bit about how they did this and how they planted information which eventually wound up in the press of the free world. He escaped to the West in 1970 after becoming totally disgusted with the Soviet system, and he did this at great risk to his life. He certainly is one of the world's outstanding experts on the subject of Soviet propaganda and disinformation and active measures. Mr. Bezmianov, I'd like to begin by having you tell us a little bit about some of your childhood memories. Well, the most vivid memory of my childhood was Second World War, or to be more precise, the end of the Second World War, when all of a sudden, United States, from a friendly uh, nation, which helped us to defeat Nazism, turned overnight into a, a deadly enemy. And it was very shocking because uh, all newspapers were trying to present an image of belligerent, aggressive American imperialism. Most of the things that we were taught is that the United States is aggressive power, which is just about to invade our beautiful free socialist country, uh, that American CIA is dropping Colorado beetles on our beautiful potato fields, to eliminate our crops. And each schoolboy had a, a picture of Colorado bug on the, on the back page of his notebook. And we were instructed to go into collective fields to search for those little Colorado bugs. Of course, we couldn't find any. Neither we could find ma many potatoes. And that was explained again by the encroachments of the decadent imperialist power. Uh, the anti-American paranoia, hysteria in, in the Soviet propaganda w was to such an, uh, of such a higher degree uh, that many less skeptical people or less stubborn would really believe that the United States is just about to invade our beautiful motherland and some secretly hope that it will come true. Mm, that's interesting. Yes. Well, getting back to uh, life inside the Soviet Union or inside communist countries in general, in this country, uh, at the university level primarily, we read and hear that uh, the Soviet system is different from ours, but not that different, and that there is a convergence uh, developing between all of the systems of the world, and that really it doesn't make an awful lot of difference what system you live under, because you have corruption and dishonesty and tyranny and all that sort of thing. From your personal experience, what is the difference between life under communism and life in the United States? Well, life is obviously very much different for the simple reason that uh, the Soviet Union is a state capitalist economically. It's a state capitalism 
where an individual has absolutely no rights, no value, his life is nothing, it's just like an insect. He is disposable, whereby in the United States, even the, the, even the worst criminal is treated as a human being, he has a fair trial, and some of them capitalize on their crimes, they, they publish their memoirs in their prisons, and uh, get handsomely paid by your crazy publishers. Uh, the uh, differences, of course, in the daily life are very various, uh, depending on who, whom we are talking about. In my own private life, I never suffered from communism, simply because I was brought up in a family of high-ranking military officer. Uh, most of the doors were open for me. Most of my expenses were paid by the government, and I never had any troubles in, uh, with the authorities or, or with the police. So, in other words, I, I would say I, I enjoyed, or I had good reasons to enjoy, all the advantages of so-called socialist uh, system. Mm -hmm. My main uh, motivations to defect was, had nothing to do with affluence. It was mainly moral indignation, moral protest, rebellion against the inhuman methods of, of the Soviet system. Well, specifically, what did you object to? I objected, first of all, against oppression of my own dissidents and intellectuals. And that was the most disgusting thing that, that I witnessed as a, as a young man, young student, who was brought up uh, at a very troublesome period in our history, from Stalin to Khrushchev, from total tyranny and oppression to some kind of liberalization. Second, when I started working for the Soviet embassy in India, I, to my horror, I discovered that we are millions times more oppressive than any colonial or imperialist power in the history of mankind. That my country brings to India not freedom, progress, and, and friendship between the nations, but uh, racism, exploitation, and slavery, and, and, and of course economical inefficiency to this country. Since I fell in love with India, uh, I developed something which by KGB standards is an extremely dangerous thing. It's called split loyalty. When an agent likes a country of assignment more than his own country, I literally fell in love with this beautiful country, a country of great contrasts, but also great humility, great tolerance, and, and if philosophical and intellectual freedoms. My ancestors used to live in caves and eat raw meat when India was a highly civilized nation 6,000 years ago. So obviously the choice was not to the advantage of my own nation. I decided to defect and to entirely dissociate myself from that brutal regime. Mr. Besmianov, uh, we've read a lot about the concentration camps and the slave labor camps under the Stalin regime. Now the general impression in America is that those things are part of the past. Are they still going on today, or what is the yes. status? Yes. There is no qualitative change in, in the Soviet concentration camp system. Uh, there are changes in, in numbers of prisoners. Again, this is uh, un unreliable Soviet statistics. We don't know how many political prisoners are there in the Soviet concentration camps. But we sure know from, from various sources that at each uh, particular time there are close to uh, 25 to 30 million of Soviet citizens who are virtually kept as slaves in forced labor camp system. The size of a population of a uh, country like Canada is serving terms as, as prisoners. Incredible. So um, I would say that those intellectuals who try to convince American public that concentration camp system is a thing of a past are either conscientiously misleading public opinion or they are not in very intellectual people. They, they are selectively blind. They, don't, they lack um, intellectual honesty when they say that.